And now we have John's entry, okay? Very, very cool. It's like a beautiful little jewel. Uh, uh, even though it is about half as long as John could have gone. Like, John, you could have scored, you know, another uh, dozen or so bars or, or more going all the way up to B in the template. You know, even though you could have done that, this is still, you know, I still have lots to talk about. Um, I'll, I'll give you lots more time than I normally would for a 13 bar entry, just to, you know, just to give you, um, you know, give you your level of support's worth, right? Um, as a semi-brev, you're entering a minimum entry, but I'll just, you know, I'll pile on some extras or some, some extra commentary. So... I just have to say, I think the whole thing is charming. I think that the slower tempo for this arrangement works great. You know, it's kind of nice to pull back a little bit from time to time. Uh, I like the way that the octaves add one after the other. You know, first bassoon, then clarinets, then oboes, which is actually kind of a nice, there's a beautiful woody sound to this, right? Um, you know, if, if you want all of the sort of same sound, then instead of putting a first clarinet in the middle, you would put uh, English horn in the middle, right? And then you get like all double reeds going all the way up. But this is very cool. Um, my suggestion here, if you've got two clarinets in B flat, is make the second clarinet do this. You know, actually make all the second players do everything at the beginning, right? And just like, just to kind of maybe the first oboe right up here cuz you know that is more more in their typical range and headspace and everything else and it's not too long but yeah just have the second player do all of this and then here you say one solo so like two here one here right so the first players get the little solos now look you don't really need to write solo here like i would say don't write solo unless like it is really obviously a solo do you know do you know what I'm saying like it's a that it's that it is something that stands out from the rest of the orchestra and that is like their big moment right but this is just a featured part I think everybody knows that it's the melody and the you know there you've scored it in a way that everybody else is going to stay out of the way right uh, I think that some of the dynamics here are a little strange though right see so you've got pianissimo crescendo crescendo and then back down again. So what is the destination finally right here? Well, we need to know, right? And then you've got triple P, and a crescendo back down, and then ending up on P here. Um, yeah, maybe this stuff mixes pretty well uh, on a sound set, but it's just like not very practical dynamics for a live situation, right? So, so I think this is what could solve everything, okay? All right, so this would be my recommendation. Don't write forte for the flutes here. Write P. Don't write mezzo forte for the um, for your solo soloing instruments for your your melodic instruments here. Just write P um, cantabile, right? And then the player will know that it's a solo and they'll play out and everything else. You don't write, need to write forte there either, right? So just keep it P, and then here this can be pianissimo, crescendo, and then back down again, right? Uh, but see, like here, this is not going to sound like pianissimo, crescendo to this is just it doesn't really lead anywhere. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, I mean, it sort of works. I won't be too fussy about that. Now here, um, the problem with celesta is that like celesta doesn't really have an have like up or down high dynamics you know that it's just is a you know i mean there are all kinds of markings for celesta to be loud or soft or this or that but you know aside from just a very very tiny little degree of force or restraint that you can use as a player it just has like it just basically plays what it plays do you know what i mean um it's like it's it sort of has a kind of um like it has a piano dynamic, right? So it's just what it is. So you just have to, so that's why you shouldn't have these guys be loud is another reason, right? So if everybody's basically playing along at piano here, then this can just be what it is, right? And, you know, these these are all very cool. These, these but it's, you know, once again, just don't even bother with the dynamics here.
Now I'm just going to check something here. I'm selecting this. This is in Sibelius. And I, you know, in the mock-up, I was listening and I was, I sort of heard that this, the glissando, like when you just assign a glissando line to, uh, to two different endpoints, two different uh, notes, then what you get is a white key glissando. Basically, the, the glissando obeys, you know, just like just plays all white keys. So what you ended up getting here was like a sort of a D a D Dorian glissando, uh, you know, in your uh, in your mockup. So here's the way around that. And that is, um, oops, wrong one. Sorry. Let's try that again. That is to get the um, add harp pedaling um, uh, utility uh, plugin. So let's see how that works, okay? So I'm going to select either end point of this glissando. Sorry, my, uh, my screen's wandering a little bit. All right, so one more time. Either end of this glissando. Okay, then I um, go back to here, home, plug-in, uh, harp glissando, and I get this little box, right? And you can, it says, use capital letters plus um, the pound sign or B for a flat, All right? So here we could use C sharp and F sharp. Oops, sorry about that. I had my finger on the wrong little gizmo. Right, so this will give you a uh, just a regular old, um, you know, uh, glissando over the D scale, right? And then, uh, and then you, you have the option of playing the last note. Um, I would say leave that out if the last note is already notated. And here it says show tuning as text, show tuning as diagram. Okay, so I would say we'll show tuning as diagram. Okay, and then we get the same exact uh, symbol that you had before. Plus, check this out, I'm going to select it and see all of this sort of blue messy stuff in here. These are all of the pitches that are, are being told, you know, that the playback is being told to play in order, right, right on the score. All right, and that's how I know that something has been used or that, um, that the Harp Glissando plugin has been used. And I think you can get it right off of the Sibelius.com website. So anyhow, um, that is that is my recommendation for, you know, juicing up these mock-ups a little bit. Um, yeah, and, and just, you know, nice, kind of nice pacing on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, the overall rhythm. It's kind of cool. I like the contrabassoon. Now, like here, you wouldn't want to go like dotted <coughs> staccato, right? So we're not going that fast. Like you cut back the tempo <coughs> to 68, right? So like if we were going at about like 104 or something uh, per dotted quarter note or 144 per dotted quarter note, then I would say, yeah, go ahead and just, you know, put staccatos on your dotted notes but it just still looks kind of weird right so like a better strategy here um would be to just like um take away those uh those dotted you see like this just is a lot cleaner and you know you it just like makes a whole lot more sense um yeah and then you are basically doubling pitches that are in line with the double basses pizzicato. So yeah, so 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 far, you know, your your basic strategy is pretty sound. Um, you know, like nothing is too far out of range, too weird or anything like that. Uh, now notice the correct use of the number one, right? We're seeing a lot of ah one, right? Which is the incorrect usage, like ah two, numbers one period or two period, right, is what we need here uh, in situations like this. And then you just have one bassoon and contra bassoon. That's kind of cool, um, sort of economizing a little bit. Now, my favorite part of this whole 
um, of this whole page were these rising horns. I thought that I thought that that was just gorgeous. That was great. Now there is one slight flaw, and that is, uh, it is hard on a horn player to play piano up on F sharp. Now I mean they will play it. They will play what they perceive to be piano, but it might stick out anyways. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like it would be hard for them to really just tail off on that note and be very, very soft. Like they would want to, you know, they want to play this and sort of round out the release on it so that it really just blended into everything else that was going on, right? And, and to make matters even more complex, you are actually doubling it on these B pitches right here, the, sorry, the, the flutes pitches, right? So it is going to sort of stand out against what is going on with the flute there and also what is going on with the, the harp, right? So the, the, like the, in, in all practicality, you know, unless you have like a really, really great horn player who's got a lot of control up there, um, like the standard horn player would be hard to, would find it hard to play this like, you know, much softer than around mezzo piano. I mean, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm exaggerating this a little bit. Admittedly, there are, you know, there are some very fine pianosimos like higher than you might expect but it's not it's just like it's like should you write that just as a you know, you know just because it's possible should you write it and I would say in this case eh, you know I mean it's kind of like with the way that you've got this beautiful line here you know what else can you do but go to horn there on the F sharp so I'm just warning you that that is just slightly problematic it's going to stick out a bit in front of these uh, flutes Right, you're saying mezzo piano here, and then crescendo, and that's all good. I'm gonna get off my mezzo piano soapbox. That's all good, but it's like, but it's still, you know, there still is a danger of the of the horn sticking out a bit against these other instruments. You know, as as sweet, you know, as the as the horn player would be able to play up there. All right, so going on to the next page, we're getting into the like our little sort of scrubbing theme as we sort of picked up from the previous page. Um, and you know, this is, this is kind of cool, you know, pizzicato bass and, um, or sorry, sorry, that's not pizzicato. Um, just like single notes on bass and cello, uh, cymbals, timpani on the, on the third baton stroke of each bar, a little touch of harp. So that's all pretty cool, you know, with the, you know, we got our our sort of triple um, triple octave here, which I feel is very effective. Bassoon, flute, and piccolo. That is a really great uh, triple octave, and it is very charming as well. It has just a very charming sound. So when you put in this little F sharp note here, which is also a triple octave here in the celesta, uh, harp, and 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 octave in the harp, then you know it really does make a whole lot of sense. This is a very sweet little tone that you are developing here. And you could hear some of that in the mock-up. And then this was great. You have the contrast of strings plus, uh, plus you know, oboe and clarinet, which make very cool, make for very cool octaves. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, that's all nice. And then having the, the bassoon and contrabassoon coming in to support, you know, it's really amazing how much you were able to get away with in this arrangement without bringing in the cello very often to uh, play octaves with the bass. Like you, you do it from time to time, but then you leave it out and you completely get away with it. So, uh, you know, say relying on bassoon or so on and so on. But like, if you really wanted to be perfect about it, you could have easily given this line right here to the violas and they could play every single note of it, right? It would, it would be absolutely no, no need to worry about it, except that you might just want that like, kind of slightly stronger, um, ruddier tone of the cellos in there as opposed to just the, um, to the kind of more uh, chesty tone of the viola. And then, yeah, and of course, like you can't beat this combination here um, of a Shalomo register clarinets plus the, uh, plus the cellos. Now, uh, one thing I neglected to mention on the first page is that I, I'm noticing that you went with B flat clarinet here, and I think it would have just been easier on everybody if you did an A clarinet, right? So that way you end up with only one flat in the key signature, and uh, you know just very very easy fingerings for the most part, as opposed to adding sharps, 
right? So, you know, more sharps in a clarinet part is really no big deal. But this is what the A clarinet is made for, right? So, so I would say just, you know, next time you are in a situation where you are playing like um, two or more sharps, use the, you know, try to default to the, uh, to the A clarinet. And I've, I've even seen it like any sharps in a key signature and a composer uh, assigning the, uh, the A clarinet, you know, any flats, uh, certainly the B flat is used for, right? But, you know, I've seen B flat clarinet scoring in, in, in some scores in G from time to time. So, uh, so one sharp is not that big of a deal, but two and up, it's just easier on the clarinet player and, you know, and people will be expecting it. All right. And then we've got these, you know, this is going to be very, very active, but at that slower tempo, it works great on bassoon. See, like a lot of these things just work really, really great at the tempo that you have marked. So, yeah. So, and this is really beautiful as well. The way that you've got your flutes and oboes in this like upper harmony here, then like supported below by like horns and bassoons and then just like a touch of strings up here right and then that makes the whole thing feel as if there are more strings than there really are of course look you got these violas and you're barely using them for anything right so like you know you, you know if you really wanted more bass support you could put this in the violas and then you just have more voices and you know you have more stuff to play with so but i mean but you kept it light and that is um you know, that is is a an important lesson, too. And then here you go, you know, when you're going back to this, uh, it seems to me that this, this, this was not really a throwaway idea, but just like, you know, you were starting to explore new pastures, tremolo, pizzicato, and like having the piccolo and the flute work in tandem. Which flute? First flute? Second flute? Which one? Which bassoon, right? So it sort of gives me the idea that maybe this was just kind of a tag on to kind of have something to fade out on. But still, you know, there's some cool ideas in here. Um, you know, uh, it's like not bad. Um, yeah, so in a situation like this, like the the best way to notate this is like this. All right, so if, if you're working with 9-8 and you want to um, have a uh, a a time value that lasts for the entire bar of 9-8. And same thing here, right? So you don't need that tide rhythm there. All you need is this, right? So the same thing here. Boom. Right? So that so that's way, way clearer, right? And then the same thing could happen in the next bar. Alrighty. So, hey, you know, um, yeah, al almost 20 minutes worth of advice just on, the, on this, uh, on these first 13 bars or 15 bars. Um, so yeah, really, really great, uh, entry, John, just really liked it a lot. So, you know, just, I hope you'll come back next year and enter this challenge again, if you have time and it would be great to see you take a crack at the next entry, sorry, the next, uh, challenge that I've got planned, the next, uh, the next excerpt that I have planned because it's really a cool piece. So, uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for sharing this with us and now, on to yet another of our semi-brev entries for the 2019 Orchestration Challenge.